Now, this evening, uh, our proceedings have the character of a celebration, and we are here to remember, to mark an anniversary, and to express gratitude for the arrival of the Russian Baltic Fleet in New York City 150 years ago today, to the day. This is the exact anniversary when the Russian Atlantic Squadron arrived in New York City. It was followed a few days later, on October 12th, 1863, by the Russian Pacific Fleet coming from Vladivostok and arriving in San Francisco. These events represent the only, the only foreign military assistance received by Lincoln and the Union during the course of the Civil War. We therefore have to make an expression of gratitude And we're also pleased to acknowledge a debt of honor. It's unfortunate that the official institutions have chosen not to acknowledge this debt of honor, but that only means that we are all the more uh, dedicated to doing so. Uh, We have to thank the Russian people and the Russian government for their assistance to the United States at a time when they were the only friend in the world. Now, in that spirit, uh, when we think of Abraham Lincoln, as people do frequently, recent movie, for example, you might think of Abraham Lincoln as somebody surrounded by people like Seward or Stanton or Thad Stevens or Thurlow Weed, the political fixer. But I would urge you rather to think of Lincoln on the international stage and therefore to realize that when it came to the world, Lincoln had one principal friend, and this was Tsar Alexander II of the Russian Empire. He also had some sympathy from places like Thailand and others, but in terms of effective aid, it was Russia. And these fleets, and the first one arrived 150 years ago tonight, these were the only manifestations of concrete military support that the United States received in the entire Civil War era. Why these things have been forgotten and neglected, we'll try to get to uh, at the end. But now, let's go back to the North, to New York City, let's say, on um, the day before, September 23rd, 1863. What was the mood? Well, the mood was somber. The summer of 1863 was a tremendous series of battles. There had been the Battle of Gettysburg, the costliest in the war, at least it was a Union victory, followed then on July 4th by the Battle of Vicksburg, coming to an end, the Siege of Vicksburg, the capitulation of General Pemberton and Grant's uh, victory. But then, especially in New York, the horrendous series of draft riots, the things that you've seen in that movie, The Gangs of New York, with lynchings, with burnings, with killing people in the streets, uh, warships and troops firing on crowds of pro-Confederate rioters. And then, just a couple of days before the Russian fleets arrived, the Great Battle of Chickamauga, often forgotten, but the second bloodiest in the entire war, had occurred, well, from our point of view today, last uh, Thursday and Friday. That was Chickamauga. And this, of course, was a Union disaster. It almost annihilated the Union army in the West and might have, uh, except for a couple of events that we can, uh, we can talk about. So by the time we got to September 23rd, it is a grim atmosphere, uh, depression, demoralization coming forward. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of somebody watching all this now from Lower Manhattan, the Battery. Shortly after Chickamauga, with its 16,000 casualties, we had Brady, Matthew Brady, the famous photographer, publishing photographs that brought home all the horror of this event. New Yorkers strolling along the Battery were astounded to see a huge steam frigate flying a foreign flag 
bristling with 51 guns, her rigging black with seamen, steam up the bay and drop anchor in the Hudson River at about the level of the spire of Trinity Church. This was the Alexander Nevsky, the flagship of the Russian Atlantic Squadron, commanded by Rear Admiral Lesovsky. The Alexander Nevsky was soon followed by the Peresviet, a 48-gun frigate. They were followed two days later by the Variag, a beautiful steam corvette, 2,100 tons, 14 guns, about the size of the Confederate raider Alabama. Within three weeks, you also had the Almaz and the Ostliaba, which steamed past the battery and anchored. There came a final ship, another steam corvette, that was the Vityaz. Now, these few ships, I would submit, changed the course of world history. On Thursday, October 1st, the New York City Council sailed down the bay to deliver a welcome resolution adopted by the city for Admiral Lesovsky. And the Russian fleet, using American-made guns, which had been cast in Pittsburgh, the Russian fleet offered a 71-gun salute, a lot of guns, which shook lower Manhattan. The city councilmen and the Russian officers sailed back to 23rd Street, where they joined a huge parade. And there was a reception at City Hall. Lesovsky and his party were taken to Matthew Brady's photography studio on 10th Street, where the admiral, his captains, and some of the crews were photographed. And if you look at Brady collections, you can see these things today. Harper's Weekly, October 17th, 1863, devoted about half the issue to these events and the parade, above all the parade. The officers of the Russian fleet riding in horse-drawn carriages, the admiral had six horses pulling his carriage, were escorted up Broadway past Trinity Church by an honor guard of U.S. troops and militia in the midst of a cheering throng. The procession passed Union Square, it wheeled into the vast current of Broadway, and as Harper's Weekly wrote, the scene became splendidly animated. The moving pageant rolled in the glittering stream down the broad thoroughfare between banks of upturned faces, the trappings of the equipages, the gold and silver epaulettes of the Muscovite guests, and the sabers, helmets, and bayonets of the escort. The cavalcade advanced to the joyous time of exulting martial music. There was a proud and gratified feeling evident in the hearts of the vast concourse assembled to greet it that would have been befitting to the most important triumphs at home. And Russian flags were everywhere. Now, sources favorable to the Confederacy point out that the Russian sailors visiting New York were so horrified at the living conditions they observed in the dreary city tenements that they donated $4,760 of their own money to alleviate these conditions. And then was the occasion of the Gala Russian Ball. It was held at the Academy of Music in early November. This was the high point of the New York social season of 1863-1864, It was a glittering event which contrasted sharply with the grim atmosphere of the Civil War. The event was catered by the famous restaurant Delmonico's, which delivered 12,000 oysters, 200 chickens, 1,000 pounds of steak, among other provisions. The Russian Baltic fleet stayed in American waters for seven months, and there were side visits to Boston, Annapolis, and Washington, D.C., Now, what did this gesture mean? Admiral Lesovsky had previously been stationed in the Mediterranean, where he became the friend of the leading Union naval commander, David Glasgow Farragut, the statue downtown here. One evening, the two admirals were visiting the New York City home of Thurlow Weed, an ally of Secretary of State Seward. Weed was the Republican boss of New York State. Farragut asked Lesovsky, Why are you spending the winter here in New York City anyway? And Lesovsky answered, I am here under sealed orders to be broken only in a contingency which had not yet occurred. 
And the Russian fleet in San Francisco was operating under identical orders, as he added. He pointed out that his orders were to break the seals of these secret documents if and when the United States were to become involved in a war with foreign powers. In 1863, this could only mean one thing. If Britain and France were to attack the United States, attempting to save the cause of the Confederacy, then London and Paris would be faced not just by a single war, but by a double war, because the fleets were the tokens, the earnest of the immense resources of the Russian Empire, its limitless spaces, its huge land armies, and so forth. It was a gesture meant to deter. Now, October 12, 1863, the Golden Gate. Um, Admiral Popov arrives, he's the commander of the Russian Pacific Fleet, on the Bogatyr. Popov was well known in California. He had visited there a number of times during the 1850s. And for him, the expressions of goodwill began almost as soon as the anchor was down. Uh, the Bogatyr was followed by the Kalevala, the Gaidamak, the Abrek, the Runda, and eventually another ship, the, uh, the Abrek. We've got that. Now, during these years, the Union had a one-ocean navy for a country that needed a two-ocean navy. The U.S. fleet was concentrated in the Atlantic, Gulf Squadron, Atlantic Squadron, for a blockade of the Confederacy. It meant that there were no warships available to defend San Francisco. According to one historian, Admiral Popov was therefore welcomed as a savior in the Golden State when he brought his squadron in, and also because of his willingness to help. Uh, on Friday, the 23rd of October, a large fire swept through the waterfront of San Francisco. Admiral Popov responded by sending a large contingent of officers and men to help suppress the blaze. And several of the Russian sailors actually lost their lives. They're buried on Mare Island, which is a, at that time was a U.S. Um, naval base. And Mare Island was also important because the Russian Empire did not have a functioning shipyard in the Pacific. So they were able to refit with the help of the carpenters, blacksmiths, machinists of Mare Island, which carried out repairs on these, on these vessels. And then came the gala ball in San Francisco, which was self-consciously uh, an attempt to uh, compete with the one in New York. The grand ball was scheduled for the evening of November 17th. For three hours, from 9 p.m. until midnight, a crowd of guests flooded in, including the highest military and civil authorities in the state. Governor Leland Stanford of the university, Governor Lowe, the mayor, the collector of the port, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, all of them showed up. The hall was lavishly decorated with Russian and American flags, with special paintings. Uh, we had the emperor and empress of Russia, and also George Washington, and wall panels. The wall panels had slogans which I think would be of interest to Americans today. One was, Russia and the United States, friends in peace, allies in war. And another one. The first Alexander advocated our peace in 1812. The second Alexander prevents war in 1863. Now, to get that, you've got to know that the reason the British were convinced to lay off the U.S. at the end of the uh, War of 1812 was a very stern warning from Russia saying, back off, uh, at a time when there was a Russian army occupying Paris, which added a little bit of oomph to that. Uh, another another uh, panel. The world has learned lessons of liberty from the Tsar of Russia. A polemic. Dancing to the music of two orchestras. The dinner began at 11 p.m. and continued till 4 o'clock in the morning uh, with a nightcap at 5 a.m. And this event was considered to be a great success. Now, again, the practical side. During the months after Admiral Popov arrived in California, there was a great fear 
of attacks by Confederate raiders like the Alabama, the Shenandoah, the Sumter, and so forth. The California state government, Governor Leland Stanford, appealed to Admiral Popoff for protection. And Popoff pledged that he would protect his hosts, saying, should a southern cruiser attempt an assault, we shall put on steam and clear for action. The Russian admiral prepared to defend San Francisco against the Confederates. Now, I um, have to point out that one of the most distinguished professors of Civil War studies in the United States, whom I had the occasion of talking to at Gettysburg this summer for the anniversary there, told me very honestly and frankly that he was not aware of that rather important fact, which I'm afraid points to the neglect of these foreign policy studies. Now, Popov went further. Popov wrote a message, and he gave it to the U.S. authorities, and he said, if any Confederates come nearby... I want you to make sure that this message reaches them. And here's his message. According to instructions received from His Excellency Rear Admiral Popov, Commander-in-Chief of His Imperial Russian Majesty's Pacific Squadron, the undersigned, the governor of California, I guess, is directed to inform all who it may concern that the ships of the Russian squadron are bound to assist the authorities of every place where friendship is offered in all measures which may be deemed necessary by the local authorities to repel any attempt against the security of the place. And he's doing this as the representative of the Tsar. Now, around the world, the strategic reverberations were felt immediately. In Britain, the Liverpool Journal was concerned about the potential that these Russian ships, seven in New York and six, I think, in San Francisco, This was not a fleet that could stand up to the Royal Navy, but as the Alabama had shown, a couple of commerce raiders could do enormous damage, and this was a large group of uh, ships. The Liverpool Journal was afraid of this. The friendly harbor of New York offers the best position that could be conceived for a station whence at any moment a fleet of Russians and Americans could swoop down on the scattered British squadron and unarmed merchantmen. Punch, the British humor magazine, it's so political. They, they, re- they were reading the Moscow Journal. The Moscow Journal was writing that, uh, the Moscow Journal was recommending a treaty with the United States so that America may be able to reckon with us, uh, Russia. The commercial world of England shuddered at the presence of Russian frigates on the open sea. The neutral ports of America were a perfect haven from which to launch an attack on British commerce. And the uh, Russian paper writes, our cruisers will be the terror of the commercial ships of hostile powers and will compel them to employ half their navies in guarding their merchantmen. Now, many leaders in London and Paris were simply apoplectic British satirists attempted to portray Lincoln and Alexander II as two brother despots, each intent on crushing an internal rebellion. And the parallel was Confederates rebelling in the United States, Poland, uh, Russian Poland had started a rebellion in 1861, and this had flared up again in 1863. Now, in its October 24th, uh, 1863 issue, Punch, printed a vicious cartoon, which you can see on my website, with Lincoln and Alexander as two arch-villains, two oppressors, uh, saying to each other, now this is in, it it rhymes, I guess we can say. Uh, Lincoln says, Imperial son of Nicholas the Great, we err in the same fix, I calculate, you with your poles, my southern rebel's eye, who spurn my rule and my revenge defy. All right, the Tsar boasts in answer, Wrath on revolted Poland's sons I wreak, and daughters too, beneath my canout they shriek. See how from blazing halls the maiden flies, and faithful Cossacks grasp the screaming prize. Lincoln, not to be outdone, says, In Tennessee, I guess, We've matched them scenes and may compare with Warsaw, New Orleans. The Vistula, 
may bear a purplish hue as deep a stain has darkened the yazoo. So Punch imagines at the end, Lincoln and his brother Despot get together and say, come to my arms and let us be allies. We'll squelch John Bull and scuttle Britain's Isle. But let us go and liquor up meanwhile. <laughs> now, Harper's Weekly had to answer. Harper's Weekly, there's a cartoon which shows Napoleon III, the dictator of France, emperor of France, and John Bull, the symbol of the British. These are the perplexed pirates, and they're looking at the port of New York from offshore through a, a spyglass, a telescope. Now, I'm going to have to do this one for you, too. The Corsair Napoleon says to his partner in crime, he says, Well, Mr. Johnny Bull, what you see is that time you peep round the corner through your big glass. And the pirate John Bull responds, I see a very suspicious cover sitting in the New York Arbor with half a dozen big Russian bloodhounds about him. And then they both groan with displeasure. Now, the coming of the Russian fleets was decisive in helping Lincoln get through the last and most serious threat of Anglo-French uh, intervention. The Laird's shipyard, which had built the Alabama, was known to be building two powerful, seagoing, ironclad warships, battleships, that could give the Confederacy the ability, finally, to break the Union blockade of the southern ports. If you read... Um, Harper's Weekly, they talk about the Anglo-Rebel Rams. The Anglo-Rebels. That's the enemy, the Anglo-Rebels for the Harper's Weekly. Um, so with the Russian vessels already at sea and reported to be coming towards America, U.S. Ambassador to London, Charles Francis Adams, felt strong enough to put a war ultimatum to the British government, to Lord John Russell I'm Lord Palmerston. And this was September 5th, 1863. And Adams says to Lord Russell, if these Laird battleships are allowed to leave port, and I quote, it would be superfluous in me to point out to your lordship that this is war. Lord Russell was shocked. According to one historian, this Yankee talked like an Englishman. Lord Russell had to pause and then backed off entirely. The Laird Rams were first put under surveillance by the British government on September 9th. They were seized by the British government in mid-October. They never fought for the Confederacy. And this change of line in London, I think, was clearly a result of the Russian fleets. And that really was the last high-profile attempt of the British and the French to intervene. In that same issue of October 1863, October 17th, Harper's Weekly called for a U.S.-Russian alliance, and they put it in these terms. The alliance of the Western powers, Britain and France, maintained through the Crimean War and exemplified in the recognition of the southern rebels by both powers conjointly. They, they're they pushing it a little bit, but in effect, that is... Um, what happened in, in practice, although formally speaking not. This is in name, in, in fact, if not in name, a hostile combination against the United States. Would it not be wise to meet this hostile alliance by an alliance with Russia? France and England united can do and dare much against Russia alone or the United States alone. But against Russia and the United States combined, what could they do? An alliance between Russia and the United States at the present time would probably relieve both of us from all apprehensions of foreign interference, the Confederacy and Poland. The reception given last week in New York to Admiral Lesovsky and his officers will create more apprehension in the Tuileries in Paris and the Court of St. James in London than even the Parrot Gun or the capture of the Atlanta. If it is followed up by diplomatic negotiations with a view to an alliance with the Tsar, it may prove an epoch of no mean importance in history. Now, responding to the arrival of the Russian fleets, 
Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells wrote to Russian Foreign Minister Gorchakov, someone we'll hear about, saying that the U.S. Navy Department was much gratified to learn that a squadron of Russian war vessels was present off the harbor of New York. Wells offered the Russian fleet the facilities of the Brooklyn Navy Yard for any repairs or refitting they might need. And then Wells wrote in his diary, In sending these ships to this country, there is something significant. What will be its effect on France and the French policy, we shall learn in due time. It may be moderate. It may exasperate. God bless the Russians. God bless the Russians, says the Secretary of the Navy. And it is the same spirit of gratitude that's reflected in the ode composed by Oliver Wendell Holmes for a friendship visit by Grand Duke Alexis to America in 1871. And Oliver Wendell Holmes writes, Thrilling and warm are the hearts that remember who was our friend when the world was our foe. Now, on October 3rd, 1863, Lincoln issued his famous proclamation establishing a yearly day of thanksgiving tradition which still thrives, of course. But we should imagine, we should examine the timing of this proclamation. The Union victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg occurred in the first week of July, several months before July, August, September, three months, 90 days earlier. After that, the news had been all bad, with the horrors of the New York City draft riots followed on the 19th and 20th by the Battle of Chickamauga, a crushing Union defeat and the second most costly battle of the Civil War. So this raises the question, what exactly was it that Lincoln wanted to give thanks for in the first week of October? Well, the obvious answer is that he was giving thanks for the coming of the Russian fleets, among other things, which were making the threat of the Anglo-French intervention recede Rapidly, Let's take a look at the text of the Thanksgiving Proclamation. This was written by Seward, foreign policy uh, uh, guy. And this seems to substantiate this view. In the proclamation, we find that the United States is, quote, in the middle of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression. In spite of this, right, so it, peace has been preserved with all nations. And I think we can say that the same mood suffuses the Gettysburg Address of November 19th, 1863, which happened to come at the height of the pro-Russian enthusiasm generated by the Russian gala balls in New York and San Francisco. And therefore... Despite the prejudices of many historians who may consider this suggestion unthinkable, we must entertain the possibility that the Thanksgiving holiday, to be sure, and the Gettysburg Address possibly, reflect the wave of optimism generated by the arrival of the Russian fleets. Now, just a year and a day after Lincoln's death, April 16, 1866, the Tsar narrowly escaped an assassination attempt. The indignation in the United States ran high. Congress passed a resolution, and the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Gustavus Vaza Fox, was selected to head a solidarity mission, which departed on board a new class of monitor. This is the double-turreted monitor, Miantanamo, equipped with four 15-inch guns. These were displayed at visits in England, Denmark, France, on the way to Russia. Upon seeing this warship, the London Times commented, the wolf is in our fold and the whole flock is at its mercy. So Fox had an audience with the Emperor <clears throat> Napoleon III of France. And bowing to military defeat, Napoleon, of course, promised to remove the French army from Mexico, where it had been violating the Monroe Doctrine. And there then followed this exchange. Napoleon says to Fox, 
do not be too friendly with Russia. Fox says, Russia and America have no rival interests. Russia has always been friendly to America, and we reciprocate the feeling. Napoleon III counters, but you can stand alone. You don't need friends. Fox says, when it was doubtful whether we should ever stand again, at a time when the most powerful nations menaced us, Russia felt and expressed her sympathy for us, and America will never forget it. We'll never forget it. Well, we hope so. Now, in the case, the, the sale of Alaska, a little bit later, 1867, the story of Alaska is that the Russian government was pessimistic about their own ability to hold Alaska against the British. So they were essentially saying it's better to put it in the hands of the United States to keep it from other hostile hands. But the original deal, as proposed by Tsar Nicholas I, was that Russia would transfer Alaska provided that the U.S. government seized the entire west coast of Canada so that there'd be no British presence there, right? This is simple maritime doctrine, right? You want to control the opposite coast um, from you. Uh, Polk, obviously, was not for this offer. The American people were yelling at this time, 5440 or fight. 5440 or fight meant that the U.S. territory would have touched the southern border of Alaska. There'd be no British presence on the coast. But unfortunately, that then did not uh, come true. Then, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated in 1881. He was widely viewed in the United States as a Christian martyr. And there is a parallelism, maybe in Plutarch's sense, between Alexander II, who freed 23 million serfs, and Lincoln, who wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. But now... With Lincoln and Alexander both assassinated, the U.S.-Russian Entente began to erode. Now, just a little bit of context on on the prehistory of all this. The relations between the United States and Russia were excellent and friendly from before the American Revolution until about 1905. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt is the guy who who wrecks the uh, continuity. Some of the earliest contact, contacts between the future United States and the Russian Empire came with Benjamin Franklin as a scientist. He was a friend of the Russian princess Vorontsova Dashkova. She was a famous uh, political and cultural figure in, in uh, Russian society. And thanks to Princess Dashkova, Benjamin Franklin was inducted as the first American member of the Russian Academy of Sciences founded by Peter the Great with the help of the philosopher uh, Leibniz. During the reign of Catherine the Great, it was the uh, electrical scientist Franz Epinus who wrote the draft of the League of Armed Neutrality from 1780 to 1783. The League of Armed Neutrality asserted that neutral countries like Russia had the right to trade with belligerents like, for example, the United States. The political sponsor of this measure was Count Nikita Panin. And Count Panin had to overcome the opposition of somebody you may have heard of, Prince Potemkin, or Pachomkin, the Anglophile wing of the Russian uh, establishment. Now, one of the most Russian of all the American presidents is, of course, John Quincy Adams, who went to St. Petersburg for the first time at the age of 14, He later served as U.S. ambassador to St. Petersburg from 1809 to 1814. John Quincy Adams was sent from St. Petersburg to the Netherlands to become the chief U.S. negotiator for the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. And it's clear that the task of John Quincy Adams was very much facilitated by that stern Russian warning to the British to end the war at the time that the Russian army was occupying Paris. And in American internal politics, the Jacksonians, for example, attacked John Quincy Adams for being too Russian. They even accused him of procuring women for the imperial court. Now, around 1840, a modernizing faction emerged in St. Petersburg under the patronage of Grand Duke Constantine. 
And this includes Prince Stroganoff. And it can, this can be the beef Stroganoff uh, person. Uh, Prince Dolgoruchi, Count Milutin, and the finance minister von Reutern. And the program of this group was to liberate the serfs, to industrialize Russia, and to cooperate with the United States. And perhaps in token of that, in 1842, the American railway designer, Major George Washington Whistler, was employed by engineer Melnikov as a consultant on the building of Russia's first important railroad from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Now, later on, we have the Crimean War in the 1850s. Uh, Russia actually hoped that the United States would join that war on the side of Russia, but unfortunately, the U.S. leadership was too weak. The Russian foreign ministry expressed its opinion to the legation here in Washington that in case of a Russo-British war, the United States would become nos alliés obligés. The, the simple idea is that the main historical hostilities of the 19th century were Russia against Britain, that's the main one, and then the United States against Britain. So there's a convergence in hostility to Britain, but as I'm going to try to argue, there's also a positive content. There's a content of what we would call pro-development uh, economics. The Russian ambassador in these years to Washington is a guy called Stuckel, and he tried very hard to get the United States to come into the war, but he, he was unable to do it. An example of what he had to deal with was James Buchanan, the later president, uh, on whose watch, of course, secession uh, occurred, could hardly be worse. Uh, Buchanan was what was known as a doughface. A doughface was a northern man with southern principles, right? Somebody was willing to take orders from what Seward called the slave power conspiracy. Buchanan was the U.S. envoy to London, and Buchanan bought into the British theory that the czar of Russia is the despot. And another doughface, President uh, Franklin Pierce, Pierce, of course, an ancestor of Barbara Bush, Barbara Pierce Bush, uh, he agreed with that too. Even so, U.S. opinion was outraged by the fact that the British were trying to recruit soldiers in the U.S. for the Crimean War. And as a result of this, the British ambassador to Washington was kicked out. He was ejected, persona non grata. American diplomats knew that the Crimean War was also directed against the United States. There's a famous speech by Lord Clarendon where he essentially says, the dismemberment of the Russian Empire and something similar for the U.S. is what we have in mind. And we can quote the U.S. Uh, ambassador to, to Russia, Thomas Seymour. He writes in 1854 to Franklin Pierce, who is not going to understand it, uh, he writes the following. The danger is that the British and French, after they have humbled the Tsar, will domineer the rest of Europe and thus have the leisure to turn their attention to American affairs. Now, you can see that there's a lot of goodwill and a lot of convergence of interest. Who brought this together? Well, it's Cassius Marcellus Clay. Cash Clay as he's known, an extraordinary U.S. diplomat, one of the greatest people ever to serve in the State Department, although I'm sure he would not be um, enthusiastically uh, acknowledged today. Cassius Marcellus Clay of Kentucky became Lincoln's ambassador to St. Petersburg. And if that's the number one most important U.S. diplomatic post. It's not an exile. It's not a Siberia. It's the heart of the matter. Cassius Clay was a relative of Henry Clay, the great compromiser. And, of course, that's the leading light of the Whig Party from which Lincoln emerged. Cassius Clay was tall, handsome, and charismatic. There's a quote from Mary Todd where Mary Todd said she wanted to marry Cassius Clay, but he chose another woman, so she had to settle for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Cassius Clay published a newspaper called The True American, See, there are different kinds, right? There are the true ones and then the ones that are not so true. I wonder what the majority is today. 
He's an abolitionist. Uh, he is a very strong opponent of slavery. He created Berea College in Kentucky, the first integrated post-secondary institution in the United States. And of his dalliances with a certain ballerina at the Bolshoi Ballet, we will say nothing tonight. <laughs> Cassius Clay had been in the running for the vice presidential slot on the Republican ticket of 1860. As I said, he's a strong abolitionist, and he wanted to fight secessionism by wiping out slavery. And this makes him a radical, opposed to the timid half measures of such people as General McClellan or General Don Carlos Buell. The problem you have, and this is the problem of Lincoln finding a general, if you have generals with social pretensions, like McClellan, they feel an affinity for the Southern planter class and they want to maintain their privileges. And of course, this is this makes waging the war uh, impossible. Now, in St. Petersburg, Cassius Clay's task is to buttress the U.S.-Russian geopolitical entente with a solid basis of economic doctrine. He's got to fight Adam Smith. He's got to fight Bentham. He's got to fight James Mill, John Stuart Mill, Ricardo, and the rest of the British school because Cassius Clay is a leading exponent of the Hamiltonian or American system of economics. That is to say, protectionism, mercantilism, and dirigism. He is a supporter of Henry Clay's classic Whig program for national economic development, and that means a protective tariff, a Hamiltonian national bank, and extensive infrastructure paid for by the federal government, even if it's only in one state. doesn't matter. Cassius Clay brought with him copies of the economic writings of Henry, Henry Carey of Philadelphia. That is a very influential pro-Lincoln economist. Uh, Carey's principles of political economy were given to the czar, the imperial family, the imperial court, and all of them were becoming increasingly, finding that they liked, they got along very well with Cassius Clay. Clay's writings obviously reinforced the tendency of reforming groups inside the top Russian nobility. Emancipation and industrialization were the key questions, and these took then the form of the Russian system, as it was known. For example, in Moscow, right, not the capital at that time, but an industrial center, Cassius Clay was invited to Moscow by the manufacturing and business community. And he writes that he gave a standard Whig, American Whig, protective tariff, anti-free trade speech for industrialization and a protective tariff. This was received with great enthusiasm, and it was reprinted in the Russian newspapers and was circulated as a pamphlet. The British ambassador was there, he kept a poker face, but one of his junior attaches exploded and screamed at Clay that he was a threat to British trade with Russia. Clay noted later on that his remarks in Moscow were in favor of what? Free labor, railroad building, rapid industrialization. And these were exactly what Clay, what, uh, what, what Cassius Clay had been recommending to the leaders of the American South instead of the foolhardy adventure of secessionism. Now, in late July 1861, after the Union disaster at the first Bull Run, Clay wrote to Seward and Lincoln about the British attitude, and he said, I saw at a glance where the feeling of England was. They hoped for our ruin. They are jealous of our power. They care neither for the North nor the South. They hate both, close quote. Cassius Clay, of course, cared a great deal about the modernization and industrialization of the Southern states. Clay then goes on, writing to Lincoln and Seward, all the Russian newspapers are for us. In Russia, we have a friend. The time is coming when she will be a powerful one for us. The emancipation move of the serfs is the beginning of a new era and new strength. Now, he had to talk to the foreign minister, Gorchakov, Prince Gorchakov. Prince Gorchakov, a little bit like Harry Hopkins 
1941 when he was sent to Moscow by Roosevelt. The big question was, will the Union collapse? Are you going to fight? Are you determined? Uh, And Clay convinced Gorchakov that Lincoln would hold firm. And we then get a landmark diplomatic note from Foreign Minister Prince Gorchakov in the name of Tsar Alexander II to Abraham Lincoln. And in this note, Gorchakov says, the Tsar that I work for is a sovereign animated by the most friendly sentiments towards the American Union. This union is not simply in our eyes an element essential to the universal political equilibrium. It constitutes, in addition, a nation to which our august master and all of Russia have pledged the most friendly interest. Now, back in the United States for a speaking tour during an interlude, there was an interlude when Simon Cameron, former minister, uh, secretary of war, was serving a brief stint in St. Petersburg. Cassius Clay told an audience at the Odd Fellows Hall here in Washington that by emancipating 23 million serfs, Alexander II had made himself one of the greatest benefactors of mankind in all of human history. And Cassius Clay then urged his listeners, here then, fellow citizens, was the place to look for an ally. Trust him and your trust will not be misplaced. Stand by him and he will, as he has often declared to me that he will, stand by you. And indeed, if we look at Russian history, the old maxim, pacta sunt servanda, you got to maintain your treaty commitments. This actually is very frequently the case. And therefore, what's Cassius Marcellus Clay's own epitaph? He wrote, he wrote and you got to think he's talking with Lincoln and uh, Grant and Sherman and all these other people in the background. He's not shy. He said, I did more than any man to overthrow slavery. I carried Russia with us. So that's the decisive thing. So the, of the events of 1863, Gettysburg, of course, Vicksburg, of course, but the Russian fleets. Now, let's just look at this interesting pattern. The pattern is that the Americans who are drawn to the Russian cooperation are also the revolutionaries or the radicals here at home. They want to attack the Southern social order and the institution of slavery. And they're also attracted to Russia. Now, a couple of uh, examples. In 1861... We have these two Confederate envoys, Mason and Slidell. They're taken off the British ship Trent as they're going to plead the Confederate cause in Europe. And the London press became hysterical with rage. And the anti-union group in the cabinet, that's Palmerston, Russell, and Gladstone, they see the chance to start a war. And, of course, St. Petersburg is watching closely. British Prime Minister Lord Palmerston dispatched a squadron of eight ships of the line and 13 frigates and corvettes under Admiral Milner to the western Atlantic. He wanted to use the Great Eastern, the largest ship in the world at that time, as a troop transport to bring redcoats to Canada. And the British were discussing bombarding and burning both Boston and New York. They concluded that Boston would be harder because of the forts and the channels. But New York was more vulnerable, especially to a surprise attack. And we have documented a hydrographer in the Admiralty saying that New York is, quote, the true heart of U.S. commerce, the center of maritime resources. To strike her, New York, would be to paralyze all the limbs. So the special relationship not working too well that day. Now, Lincoln, of course, commenting that one war at a time was enough, uh, ended this crisis by turning Mason and Slidell over to the British. The thing that most historians will say, this crisis was ended by Prince Albert, right? Prince Consort, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. At the end of his life, on his deathbed, he said, we've got to have peace. Well, maybe, but I think more important is a message from the Tsar. This is sort of a circular to the powers, He says, um, Russia will support in every way possible 
and aid to the full, fullest extent of his power, the Tsar's power, it's his ancient ally, the United States of America, in its struggle against treason. Under no circumstances will the Tsar permit, if his efforts can prevent it, the success of the lately inaugurated rebellion against the laws and government of a friendly country. <laughs> That's better than many Union generals at the time could do. Um, so I would say that that uh, warning, and not so much the efforts of Prince Albert, stopped the London uh, interventionists. Now, 1862-1863, briefly. Lee made two invasions of the North. One is the one that leads to Antietam in September 1862, and then Gettysburg, July 1863. What were these invasions? What was the military political point? I would say they were both very much calculated to procure the recognition of the Confederacy by London and Paris, followed by Anglo-French military intervention against the Union. There is no Confederate, or there's almost no Confederate success scenario that does not include the intervention of the British and French. Confederate strategy cannot be understood without keeping the question of Anglo-French intervention constantly in mind. Now, Lord Palmerston, on September 14th, 1862, Lee is in Maryland. Lord Palmerston is hoping that Lincoln will be driven from Washington the Army of the Potomac will be defeated and dispersed. So he contacts Lord Russell. Palmerston is the Prime Minister, Lord Russell, the Foreign Secretary. He contacts Russell and says, well, if that happens, intervention might be feasible. And, and Russell says, essentially, let's not wait. Let's intervene no matter what. Let's have a cabinet meeting right away and intervene. And we have to remember when we hear the uh, crocodile tears of the London cabinet, right? they're so concerned about the human suffering. Uh, remember that these are the people who had just supervised the repression of the Great Mutiny or Sepoy Rebellion in India, 1857. India had rebelled against the British East India Company. And the British had put down the rebellion. It is one of the greatest massacres of the 19th century. The repression is known in India as the devil's wind. The dead go into the hundreds of thousands. Villages annihilated. Right? Sherman, Sheridan, don't come close. So these are the humanitarians that are going to intervene. And remember also, the British-French combination had attacked China with three opium wars, Indochina with the French invasion, Russia with the Crimean War, Mexico with the French army, India in the rebellion we've just said, and sponsoring the Confederate States of America. So these are not exactly um, Pacific powers, peaceful powers. All of this after 1848. I'm afraid 1848 is the British destabilizing many of the continental countries. It's a little bit like Arab Spring, springtime of nations, 1848. At any rate, October 29, 1862, there's a meeting in the Russian foreign ministry with Gorchkov, Prince Gorchkov, the foreign minister, and now the U.S. charge d'affaires, Bayard Taylor, went on to become a, a well-known writer. There's a, it's a formal Russian pledge never to move against the United States and to oppose any attempt by others to do so. And Taylor wrote back to the State Department that the Russian foreign minister had said, you know the sentiments of Russia... We desire, above all things, the maintenance of the American Union as one indivisible nation. He points out that there will be, pro there will be proposals of intervention from Britain and France. We believe that intervention could do no good. Proposals will be made to us for some plan of interference, and we will refuse any intervention. And he stresses the continuity of the Russian policy. Now, the Journal de Saint-Petersbourg, the official gazette of the Tsarist government, denounced the Anglo-French intervention plan of fall 1862, inspired by Lord Russell and Napoleon. This article, by itself, helped to prevent a wider war. The British cabinet, informed of the Russian attitude by telegraph, voted down 
the war party of Palmerston and, and Russell. And by November, it was clear that there was no, no opportunity to intervene in that year. Now, this is what I've said so far. This is what's known in public. This was, this was pretty much public. But now, we can go a little bit deeper. This refers to a document which I have on my website, tarpley.net. It's written by Wharton Barker. Wharton Barker was a banker for the Tsar in the 1870s. And a little bit complicated, but Wharton Barker in 1905 looks back to a talk with the Tsar in 1879 about these events in 1862. All right? So anyway, here we go. The Tsar says to Barker, 1879, the Tsar is talking now, in the autumn of 1862, the governments of France and Great Britain proposed to Russia the joint recognition by European powers of the independence of the Confederate States of America. My immediate answer was, I will not cooperate in such an action. I will not acquiesce. On the contrary, I will accept the recognition of the independence of the Confederate States by France and Great Britain as a casus belli for Russia. I will go to war over this. And in order that the governments of France and Great Britain may understand that this is no idle threat, I will send a Pacific fleet to San Francisco and an Atlantic fleet to New York. Sealed orders to both admirals were given. And then he continues, the czar. My fleets arrived at the American ports. There was no recognition of the independence of the Confederate States by Great Britain and France. The American rebellion was put down and the great American republic continues. Then he goes on to say, all of this I did because of love for my own dear Russia rather than for love of the American Republic. I acted thus because I understood that Russia would have a more serious task to perform if the American Republic, with its advanced industrial development, were broken up and Great Britain should be left in control of most branches of modern industrial development. So he's saying, I don't want the British to have the monopoly of modern technology. I want to have a second power to whom I can turn. Some historians are scandalized by this. They say, well, that means it's not a real alliance. In other words, they say, if it's based on mutual interest, that's not real. It's got to be completely one way, altruistic, one way street. Otherwise, it's not real and you've been duped. No. The alliances that are rooted in mutual interest are the most stable and effective. What else can we want in this uh, veil of tears? Now, let me just go on with a little bit more about the Tsar, so you get perhaps insights into him, but also into the Russian foreign policy a little bit more in general. Tsar Alexander II sees himself as regulating a balance of power. It's what the British always wanted to do, or they claimed to do, although they wanted a balance of power favorable to Britain. He wants one favorable to the Russian Empire. And you can see what he says. On a world scale, I've got to have the U.S. there, because otherwise I'm all alone, and I'm going to be the target of, of everything. How about the case of the Danish War, right, with Prussia and Austria against Denmark, 1864? The Tsar says, I was silent, I stayed out, but I didn't say anything, and the British and the French were afraid to intervene on the side of Denmark. 1866, the Seven Weeks War. This is Prussia defeating Austria. He says again, I was silent. See, he can do diplomacy just by saying nothing. I was silent, and France did not support Austria. Because of my silence, France hesitated to act until it was too late and the dreams and ambitions of Bismarck were realized. And the Tsar says, my purpose was the establishment of a European balance of power that would be a menace to Great Britain, to contain them and to balance them. 1870, he says, to complete German unity and to enable German manufacturers to strike at British industrial and commercial supremacy, it was the plan of Bismarck for taking... Alsace-Lorraine from France 
And he said, I wanted to make sure that nothing got in the way of that. And therefore, in 1870, when the French-German War opened, I let it be understood that any assistance to France from Austria or Great Britain would be followed by Russian support of Germany. So he sums up saying, my support, Russian support of Germany in those three wars was because my Russia would profit. But then, he says this has a limit, in the 1880s, Bismarck was going to pick a quarrel with France, except that I told them to cool it. The Russian-French understanding now is preserving the peace in Europe. So you can see, this is what a statesman would do. He attempts to establish a balance of power favorable to his own country. He does not act as a belligerent, but he acts as a kind of a regulator, and sometimes he can do it just by saying nothing. Now, as for Foreign Minister Gorchakov, he prefers peace, but he's not a softy. In February 1862, he asked the Russian uh, intelligencer coming back from America, can the U.S. Navy maintain an effective blockade of the southern ports? And Gorchakov, uh, the, the guy can't tell him because that's not his specialty. So Gorchakov says, I will find out whether the U.S. has enough vessels to, main the, to maintain the blockade. And if they haven't, we have. Russia has. Russia is going to maintain the blockade. The emperor, my august master, will not permit anyone to interfere with this blockade, even if he has to risk another allied war. So he can be tough. Cassius Clay, at a certain point, hears that a Confederate ambassador has come to St. Petersburg. He goes to the foreign ministry and he asks Gorchakov, have you received the Confederate? And in, in the terms of one of these observers, he's, no, thundered Gorchakov in majestic disdain. He dare not come here. So the, perso- the persona non grata is the, is the Confederate ambassador. Now, it's interesting, Yevgeny Primakov, Prime Minister of Russia, was an admirer of Gorchakov, and Sergei Lavrov in our own time today is also uh, interested in Gorchakov. He tells us in a recent interview that Gorchakov had restored Russian influence in Europe after the defeat in the Crimean War, and he did it without moving a gun. He did it exclusively through diplomacy. And Lavrov cites Gorchakov in the following terms. This is Gorchakov talking now. Universal peace is a basis for natural relations among states. This basis ensures equality of all countries, big and small. Foreign intervention into the domestic matters is unacceptable. It is unacceptable to use force in international relations, especially by countries who consider themselves the leaders of civilization. Lavrov says this is a precursor of the UN Charter. Now, in conclusion, two little portraits of a couple of Russians uh, who contributed to the Union side in the Civil War. First of all, we have Colonel Charles de Arnaud, A-R-N-A-U-D. He is an officer of the Russian Intelligence Service. He's an experienced military engineer. He was sent on a reconnaissance mission by the foreign ministry, by Gorchakov, I guess, to the United States in June 1860. And he goes to Ambassador Stuckel, the Russian ambassador, and Stuckel tells him that the main Confederate effort of 1861 is not going to be made against Washington, but in the Trans-Appalachian West. So D'Arnaud goes out to St. Louis and meets with General John C. Fremont, who at that point is the commander of the Western Theater. This, of course, is the Pathfinder of the West and the 1856 Republican presidential candidate. And Fremont is also somebody who wants to end slavery as soon as he can, so soon that that Lincoln has to disavow some of the things that he does because he gets ahead of the uh, border state curve as Lincoln saw it. Now, one of uh, of Fremont's biggest concerns is to prevent the Confederates from capturing Cairo, Illinois, right? Written Cairo, what? Cairo, Illinois and invading the rest of Illinois. Around this time, Lincoln had stated 
if the Confederates can invade Illinois, the British and the French will recognize the Confederacy. All, that would be all the pretext they need. So D'Arnaud goes on a dangerous reconnaissance mission, espionage mission, behind the Confederate lines. He gets received by these Confederate generals who are impressed by his continental uh, savoir faire, I guess. And he comes back and he says, the South is about to take the offensive in the West. So D'Arnaud influences a couple of key decisions. One is, he gets Fremont to call upon the governors of Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri to mobilize much faster than they had been planning to do. Basically says, your timetable is not good enough. Got to move faster. D'Arnaud also convinces the Union commanders to build the famous 90-day gunboats. These are the ones known as the Eads Rams, the Pook Turtles, built in St. Louis, the Benton, the Carondelet, and others. There's one of them at Vicksburg that has been brought up that you can see. Uh, these ships were key to so many Union victories in, in the West. But now, this is the most interesting one. Um, D'Arnaud comes back with intelligence that the Confederate commander, Leonidas Polk, right, the Episcopal bishop, is about to seize Paducah, Kentucky, on the Ohio River. So uh, D'Arnaud, wounded in the head, rides around the clock for several days, reaches Cairo, Illinois, and seeks out the Union commander. And the Union commander is a nondescript, obscure Ulysses S. Grant. So he goes to Grant, and he says, Look, Grant, the whole war in the West depends on you getting to Paducah fast. And Grant is impressed by D'Arnaud. He acts on the advice, and he beats the Confederates to Paducah by six hours. And that's September 6, 1861. And the strategic consequences are immense. The Confederates lose all of western Kentucky. They lose the ability to have a defensive line along the Ohio River, which Jefferson Davis had been planning. And they lose the fortress of Columbus, Kentucky, which is up on the bluffs. It's like Vicksburg. There would have been two Vicksburgs instead of one if Columbus, Kentucky had not fallen. And if Polk had gotten to Paducah first, he could have captured Louisville, Louisville, Cairo, carrying the war into the north. And Grant later wrote in his memoirs that Arnaud's urgent report was the only reason that he chose to move against uh, Paducah. Now, the capture and fortification of Paducah was Grant's first big break. It put him on the map. He took Paducah and Smithland. These two towns control the confluence of the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers with the Ohio. And that's the basis of Grant's entire strategy, is to go down those rivers to Forts Henry and Donelson and all the way into northern Alabama. And by the time Grant got to Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, he became a major general and was on his way to greater things. And of course, the gunboats that Arnaud had recommended could then go all the way into Alabama and, uh, and further. So it had taken a fine Russian hand to launch the career of General Grant. Just one more, um, one more Russian. The other distinguished Russian, John Basil Turchin, a Don Cossack. He had moved to Chicago, worked in railroading, and joined the Union Army. He had attended the Imperial Military School in St. Petersburg. He had served uh, in the Crimean War as a colonel of the staff of the Russian guards in Hungary after 1848 and in the Crimean War. And Turchin is another revolutionary radical. He believes in freeing slaves. He's, for example, he's horrified that Union officers are willing to send slaves back to their so-called owners when they've been able to, to escape. He says, you can't do that. You've got to uh, keep, keep these people on your side. So he's aggressive and uh, he is key. He has a commander who vacillates and he says, why don't you go and capture Huntsville, Alabama, and you can break the Confederate East-West Railway that goes through there. 
and the, the superior officer says, okay, and they do it, and it works. Now, at an early point in the war, thanks to this, Turchin's brigade is occupying Athens, Alabama, and by now the commander is Don Carlos Buell, another one of these um, martinets. He believes in the drill, not fighting, and he's an expert of cabinet uh, warfare. So Buell says, don't touch property, don't touch the social order, send all the slaves back. So at a certain point, Confederate partisans, supported by the local population, overran one of Turchin's regiments. So Turchin says, boys, I'm going to close my eyes for two hours, and then I'll be back. So the, the troops get the hint, they loot the town. Don Carlos Buell is scandalized. He puts Turchin under a court-martial. And I don't know what would have happened, except that Lincoln intervened and promoted Turchin then to Brigadier General. This incident seems to have given birth to the song, Turchin's Got Your Mule. When the Confederate um, aristocrats would say, what happened to my property? The Union troops would say, hey, Turchin got your mule. So that was taunting them. In other words, before there was Sherman, before there was Sheridan, before there was the hard war, there was Turchin, who had learned that in the um, Crimean War. Now, at Chickamauga, 150 years ago this past week, Turchin personally led not one, but two counterattacks that saved the day. The first is, on the first day of Chickamauga, to stop a thrust by the Confederate Corps of Cheatham, and the second is on the second day when Turchin protected the left flank of the fallback position occupied by General George Thomas. And if you look at the map, Turchin has to go from the far right wing of Thomas all the way to the far left wing and then deal with a Confederate force under Liddell, who was going to cut off the Union retreat. Now, of course, um, I hope people remember General George Thomas. We've got Thomas Circle, of course, downtown. The Rock of Chickamauga. Later, the hammer, the sledgehammer of Nashville. But if we remember the Rock of Chickamauga, we have to remember that he had help. He had somebody like Turchin to help him protect his flank at the critical moment. One last thing about Turchin. November 1863, the, the anniversary is coming up. The Battle of Missionary Ridge near Chattanooga, there were three brigades that just started to go up the hill, up this precipice practically, the most successful frontal attack of the entire Civil War. Turchin was one of them. Turchin's importance is reflected by the fact that one of the National Park Reservations at the top of Missionary Hill, is dedicated to Turchin. It's the Turchin Reservation. So, if we look at Grant's career, Missionary Ridge was Grant's last battle in the West, because after that, he was brought to Washington to command all the armies of the United States. Grant had been helped in 1861 by intelligence from D'Arnaud, go and capture Paducah today. In 1863, he benefited, Grant benefited from the leadership of Turchin. And the other interesting thing about Turchin is that he was accompanied on his campaigns by his very vivacious wife, Nadine, and she happens to be the author of the only history of Civil War military campaigns written by a woman who was also an eyewitness. Now, the end is why are these events especially the Russian fleets, so neglected, so little studied. Why, for example, at the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg, there were five or six days of lectures back to back. There was nothing at all about foreign policy in any form. And I guess the reason is that as soon as it becomes foreign policy, it becomes what I'm talking about, which some people find embarrassing. Some scholars obviously are happy to sacrifice truth to the Anglo-American special relationship. I think Alan Nevins is one of these. You can read, I have an essay on my website, tarpley.net, where you can see that. There are also those other scholars that I mentioned who basically say, well, if it's based on mutual interest, then it's, it's corrupt, it's not, it's not real. Let's just see how this happened. U.S.-Russia relations, very cordial from before the beginning 
until about 1905. How did it, how did it change? One is a guy called George Kennan. It's maybe not the George Kennan you think. It's George Kennan the Elder, the uh, so-called explorer in the 1880s. So what does he do? He's a kind of, um, what can we say? He's a 19th century Samantha Power. He's concerned with human rights. He goes to Siberia and he says, look, there are these prison camps in Siberia. This is terrible. So we've got to somehow, instead of putting that in the context of the world as it was, make that the only issue and start being anti-Russian. It's interesting that the, the family business of the Kennan family is Russophobia. Because not only do we have George Kennan, we have George E. Kennan, I think it is, in the State Department in 19, in the 1940s, writing the so-called Mr. X long telegram that it's time to start the Cold War. So that's one thing. Then the big turning point, Theodore Roosevelt. In the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, the British decided they wanted to build up Japan to contain Russia in the Far East, to drive Russia back into Europe. Um, unfortunately, Theodore Roosevelt uh, imitated the British policy of King Edward VII and took very strongly the side of Japan. The cherry trees are a monument to that mistaken policy, I would say. But after 1905, you can see all of the scholars who are pro-Theodore Roosevelt, pro-Bull Moose, pro-Anglo-Saxon, vigorous living, they begin to become anti-Russian. Uh, and then, of course, the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War is probably the biggest single one that's still operative today. Uh, we would have to ask, was, was the Cold War inevitable? Was it really needed? I would say uh, not needed. Franklin D. Roosevelt obviously thought that the way the world could have uh, done best after 1945 was essentially a U.S.-Russian condominium. And it may be that this, uh, this could even hold true today. We'd have to look into it. I would say the person who did most, for example, to turn Harry Truman into an anti-Russian point of view is uh, Avril Harriman, Roosevelt's uh, ambassador to Moscow, who as soon as Roosevelt had died, came flying home to try to indoctrinate uh, Harry Truman. Just a couple of words about this. At the time, Walter Lippmann, Walter Lippmann, known in these halls as a famous correspondent, Walter Lippmann in 1945 wrote that the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union is not inherent in the nature of things. It's caused by the inexperience and emotional instability of our own delegation, Statinius, Harriman, people like this. But he says, there's a far deeper conflict of interest between the British and the Soviets than between Washington and Moscow. And Lippmann says, we've made a mistake. We've allowed ourselves to be placed in a position where instead of being the moderating power which holds the balance, we have become the chief protagonists of the anti-Soviet position. None of this would have happened if Roosevelt were still alive. And Lippmann then says, we're going to have more conflict, quote, if we do not recover our own sense of national interest about the fundamental U.S.-Russian relationship. Now, if you uh, dial up the Why We Fight series of World War II, you will see that Frank Capra, at the beginning of the, uh, the Russian one of Why We Fight, he quotes Frank Knox, Republican, Secretary of the Navy, candidate for Vice President against Roosevelt. And Frank Knox says, We and our allies owe and acknowledge an everlasting debt of gratitude to the armies and peoples of the Soviet Union. And you've heard, and that's the same kind of uh, language we've heard from Gideon Wells and and some others. So, uh, you pays your money and you takes your choice. You can choose the pro-Russian camp with Benjamin Franklin, John Quincy Adams, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin D. Roosevelt, or you can go into the anti-Russian camp with uh, Andrew Jackson, Jefferson Davis, Harry Truman, and other worthies. I think that's an easy choice. Now, Wharton Barker puts it this way, this banker, 
writing in 1905. He says, in 1905, I think he's trying to push back against some of the Theodore Roosevelt stuff. Americans cannot forget the Russell Palmerston, Palmerston Louis Napoleon proposal to attack the U.S. or the Alexander answer of 1862 to 1863. They remember that we owe almost as much to Russian action in 1863 as to French action in 1878. But if they give due thought to the words of Emperor Alexander II, they will do what is more vital in the shaping of the destinies of a nation. They will understand, understand something. So again, Lincoln had one friend in the world, Tsar Alexander II, and the only military assistance for the Union from anybody in the world is what we've just discussed. Now, there is in American politics a procedure which I think is still honored in some quarters. It's called Getting Right with Lincoln. And it says, if you're a politician, if you're a public activist, you have to ask yourself periodically, is what you are doing coherent with the principles of Lincoln? And you have to search your conscience to this effect. Now, perhaps tonight we've been able to add or strengthen at least an additional dimension to what it would mean to get right with Lincoln in foreign policy, because it's usually interpreted in terms of domestic policy only. But in terms of foreign policy, are we right with Lincoln today? And this would be a question for everybody, all the way up to the White House. I'm afraid that right now we're not so right with Lincoln, and we ought to do something so that we could get right with Lincoln in the sense that we've described it tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.